Hey, everybody. Here I am with Eric Joseph. How you doing, Eric? Fantastic. Let me switch you over to that view. Great. So, yeah, Eric's going to be talking about six steps. What is the exact title? The six steps to... Uh, six steps perfect. to making perfect inkjet prints. That's right. Excellent. So, we already have people coming in. So, first person is just says Facebook users. So, let me remind everyone... So first thing is, let us know where you're watching from. You usually get a pretty international crowd. And please give StreamYard permission to show your name and profile pic. So I'll be able to credit you when you comment or ask questions. That is the StreamYard.com slash Facebook link that you see underneath any of the lives. So yes, let us know where you're watching from in the comments. Looks like people are starting to come in. Don't be shy. Let us know. There we go. We have a John Bosma in Los Angeles. Uh, hey, John. John follows me all over the place. Oh, great. <laughs> we have uh, Hannah in uh, Belgrade, Serbia. Howard Simpkins. Good to see you here, Howard, from Toronto. Got AJ from Brooklyn. Yes. Permission granted. <laughs> Cheryl Walsh is here from Southern California. How are you doing, Cheryl? Yay, Cheryl. She does, great, she does great work. We have someone from Pasadena. Good to see you both. So, yeah, give StreamYard permission to show your name and profile pic. That's StreamYard.com slash Facebook. Let us know where you are watching from, everybody. And then um, while we're waiting for people to come in and build up the attendance, let me give a little shout out. Thank you to StreamYard. As you can see in the top right. <laughs> uh, Christmas <cute> duck. duck. <laughs> you got the little StreamYard. So yeah, StreamYard, the multi-streaming video platform. I stream to three or four different Facebook groups, Twitter, sometimes LinkedIn, YouTube. And I believe you can also stream to Twitch. So you do a little uh, intro video of StreamYard. Thanks, StreamYard. Cool. And there's the StreamYard duck making his holiday debut. Does the duck have significance? That's like their logo. So, yeah. Well, like Hannah Mueller has a rooster. Most people don't realize that Hannah means rooster in German. Mm. Right? So Hannah Mueller is mill of the rooster. Nice. So just curious to know if there was like a certain significance to the duck. I guess stream, duck floats on the stream. I would think that would be a fish. <laughs> <laughs> but I okay. Mean, so we Whatever. Got we'll have to we'll have to ask them. Excellent. So we got more people joining. So we got uh, Mary oh, in Mary. California. Yeah, we spoke yesterday. Excellent. Susan from Scottsdale, Arizona. Mark in Prescott, Arizona. That's no a Mark. Cool image. I like the uh, portrait image. Frederick in Vienna, Austria. Good old Europe. And Joyce from. Cypress, California. And we were just talking about him before we began. Art is here. Yay, Art. Good to see you here, Art. He did a presentation for us as well. It was a great one. Mm. So great I will be shouting, there. I will be shouting out to Mark or to nice. uh about, to Art. Art. Yep. He's a, he gives really good information on color management. I'm just gonna touch on it today, but cool. He's got a great YouTube channel with really good information. And then we have uh, Carrie in Australia as well. So I love about these events, quite uh, international crowds. So, mm -hmm. okay. So um, already been about five minutes. So Eric, you want to uh, introduce yourself and uh, let people know who you are? Yes, we'd love to. So Great. 
Hello, everybody. Um, as you are already aware from the title, uh, my name is Eric Joseph, and um, I have devoted my career to understanding the fine art of digital printmaking, everything from monitors, monitor calibration, and uh, everything to know about paper and printing. And I spend my days really helping uh, people kind of get through the technology, solve problems, and attain you know, the best quality product they can on their inkjet printer. Uh, my day job is I work for a company that's um, been, uh, I guess we're kind of known as an institution in the uh, photo industry. It's Freestyle Photographic and Imaging Supplies. We've been in business now for uh, 75 years. We started 1946. And um, I am now co-president and uh, chief products education uh, a sales officer. I, um, as my title suggests, I'm, I'm kind of the go-to guy for technical information in the company. Uh, I've been there for 35 years. So I myself have a very, very long history in the photo industry. And, um, and especially uh, because of my, you know, position in, in at freestyle and in the industry, I have access to every technical person. So I have really, I guess what you would call unlimited resources to really find out the real correct uh, uh, information and uh, about all of these products. And I try very hard to, like I said earlier, contribute to people's success. Um, I've got a bit of a, a keynote presentation I put together to go over this topic. Uh, I have uh, in the past, uh, especially over the last 10 years, I've traveled all over the country doing uh, workshops and seminars at colleges and universities, galleries, um, museums, commercial labs, trade shows and events. Uh, specifically, I've done workshops and seminars on the topic of inkjet paper, which is a very specific area of expertise for me. I really approach all, everything about digital printmaking from a standpoint of paper and paper choice. And we'll be talking about that a bit. Um, I also do workshops in color management. I've also done workshops uh, for uh, at Canon Learning Centers, uh, Leica Academy. Uh, I teach uh, for the Los Angeles Center of Photography here in um, Los Angeles, California. Great. I've also done workshops and seminars at all sorts of other uh, nonprofit photographic uh, education organizations throughout the country. And uh, during the pandemic, I've also been performing uh, many workshops via Zoom. So I've ported a lot of the information I've had to uh, keynote and Zoom presentations. And uh, so I just want to start. Um, this is short uh, for me anyway. I will warn you ahead of time. If you ask me a question, I'm probably the person that will, um, you know, um, like if you ask me what time it is, I'll tell you how the watch was made. Uh, so I try to give, uh, try to be very informational. Great. Uh, and generally in my presentations, because I have a lot to say, it's kind of like taking a, taking a sip of water from a fire hydrant. So I've made this presentation into something that um, I'd like to click through. And then if you have questions, please type them into the chat and uh, Andrew will, uh, strategically interrupt me if it's appropriate. Okay. Otherwise, um, I kind of want to get through this because sure. uh, it's a concise, there are six steps to uh, making perfect inkjet prints. And Great. I just kind of want to click through it. And then if you have questions, like I said, put them in the chat area. So, Sounds perfect. So I am going to click share now. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, you just need to hide the uh web browser and go to keynote and then I'll switch over okay, the view. Okay. So I will hide that and go to keynote. How's that? There look? we are. Looks perfect. Okay. And then so, let me get rid of the stream yard um, duck. <laughs> Where are you? Where's, there we go. <laughs> uh, that's gone. And uh, shall I take it full screen so people can really focus in yeah. on the uh, information? Yeah. Go. And then I've kind of looked at this on an iPhone as well. So it reads pretty well. So I'm going to click through here. So uh, here's your uh, beautifully executed uh, title page. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Uh, and you see our website at the uh, bottom of the page. 
so uh, just to jump right into it, these are the six steps. Um, it's really not that hard once you know what you're doing. Uh, I have found that um, my world every day is working with people who are having problems with printing. For some reason, our industry, I don't know what it is, but they've done a pretty poor job at educating us on how to get ink on paper and make it look amazing. And uh, I am going to divulge the basic secrets. Obviously, there's a, this is very rich. There's a lot of information, and I encourage you to connect with me after the session, either via email um, uh, or direct message on Facebook. So here's the six steps, um, and it's all about preparation. The first thing is having the right monitor. I cannot emphasize how important this is. I work with a lot of customers who have Apple computers and Apple monitors. And unfortunately, contrary to what most people think, Apple does not make our their computers and their monitors for photographers who want to print their work. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. They're flattering. They're, uh, but they're the wrong color space. They're a P3 color space, and I'll touch upon that a little later. They're very glossy. They're very contrasty. They're everything about Apple computers today is designed around video editing. And that's very different from what we need for somebody who's going to edit still images. And the brand that we uh, at Freestyle carry and really support is BenQ. They've been around for a very long time. They're an excellent uh, monitor manufacturer, provide an excellent value for the quality of monitor that you get. Uh, monitor calibration is important. Uh, you buy a monitor and you say, well, it's calibrated out of box. Well, it's calibrated for consistency, but it's not calibrated for what you might want to do with it. And again, th there's a lot of myths and mysteries out there in the world and, and also a lot of misinformation. And the thing is, is that uh, your monitor really does need to be calibrated on a regular basis. It, it will drift over time. It'll, it's very easy on an Apple display, certainly, to make it brighter or darker. Uh, I have performed calibrations for people when they first get their monitor, then they forget to do it for two years. We do another calibration. We could switch to, between the calibration that was done two years ago and now. Monitor's totally different. So monitor calibration is something that you really should do on a regular basis, and I recommend once a month or when you're going to print. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, paper, paper's the most important part of the process if you're going to print your work. Uh, we have hundreds of, pe of individual uh, papers to choose from, from all of the major brands that you see there on the left-hand side, Arista 2, uh, which is our private label uh, brand at Freestyle. We have Awagami, which is a 300-year-old paper mill in Japan that makes traditional washi paper. Canton Infinity, which is from France and a uh, one of our premier brands of inkjet paper. And they've just come out with some really new, exciting uh, papers this year, which we'll talk a little bit about a little later. Epson, which most people know. Uh, and they have a really extensive and popular brand of paper. Hanamile, another one of our premier brands made in Germany. Uh, I was telling Andrew earlier, Hanamile, uh, one of the things it's, it's hard for us in the United States to say because it's got umlauts over the U. It means, uh, and this is how I remember it, Hana is rooster and Mula is, mu is, is mill in German. So it's the mill of the rooster, and that's why they have a rooster in their logo. Most people don't know that. Oh, I should probably also mention that the O in Canson is a graphical representation of a hot air balloon because they were first in flight. Uh, first hot air balloons were made out of Canson Vidion vellum. And most people don't know that either. Fun facts. I have a lot of that going around in my head. Ilford, a great brand of inkjet paper. Uh, also the brand that's shared by Harman Technologies on the darkroom side. So it is a uh, long legacy uh, history in the photo industry, especially in the darkroom world. Uh, Innova is another brand that we support, uh, stands for Innovate in terms of uh, inkjet paper. They have also some very interesting products. And then, of course, Moab, uh, which started in the Southwest, and their papers are named after uh, famous uh, Indian, uh, you know, uh, um, 
American Indian names and such. Uh, and they have a really popular brand of paper as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. Uh, I do not want to turn this into a world of inkjet paper presentation, which I could perform for uh, two hours. And we only have an hour here to cover six steps for printing. So, uh, so paper is super important. It is what we uh, need to focus on in terms of establishing a unique artistic signature for our work. And uh, every paper is going to have uh, a real impact on how people perceive our work. Uh, we're going to spend a little time talking about printers. Um, uh, you need to choose a printer that matches uh, your needs and your lifestyle, whether it's a desktop printer or a uh, freestanding large format printer. Uh, custom paper printer profiles are critical for me. Uh, yeah, you can use a generic profile from a manufacturer's website, but it's never for your printer. Uh, and we will talk about that. And then, of course, the lighting that you're going to be viewing the print under, also critical. Now, uh, preparation is the key. I can take just about anybody's file, put it on my computer, look at it on my monitor, make a print, and it will look with, like what I see on my monitor within 90% because I followed these six steps. If you skip any one of these steps, you're gonna make a sacrifice. You're gonna to have to compensate in some way. So these are my six steps. Uh, so monitors, uh, like I said, we carry BenQ as a brand. Uh, here are the uh, monitors that are currently available. The reason why I like BenQ is because uh, this series of monitor, the SW series, is um, uh, wide gamut and accurate for representing 99% of the Adobe RGB 1998 color space. That is what we use for digital fine art printmaking. Uh, all Apple monitors that are produced now are P3, and it is different. It's designed for digital video. The most popular monitor that we offer is the SW270C. It is a standard resolution monitor at 2.5K. It is not a 4K monitor. We don't need 4K monitors when we're editing for still images. We need 4K if we're editing for video. So if you want video, if you want a 4K monitor, there are two 27-inch models available, the SW271, uh, which is just like a 270, except it's 4K. Uh, but the USB-C cable will not power your laptop. Uh, on the 270C, it will. All of the C monitors will power a laptop. The one cable provides uh, power to a hub that's on the left-hand rear side of the monitor. Um, it will power your laptop, and it will handle the video signal. Uh, the SW271C um, does power your laptop, and then at the high end, the highest level, uh, there's a 32-inch version, which is $2,000. Um, the competing brands would be NEC and ISO, and they would be quite a bit more expensive. And I really feel that uh, when you're buying a BenQ monitor, you're getting a great monitor for a good value. All of the monitors, as you see, come with a shading hood or a viewing hood. That focuses your eyes on what you're doing. I think that's a, also very important to think about when you have a monitor. If you have a monitor without the shading hood, you're seeing everything that's behind the monitor. So, And it is included in the price of the monitor. Um, these monitors also will project um, P3 color space. So you're getting kind of two monitors um, or more because it has other color spaces in it at the same time. They do have a lower priced brand that's for designers that are P3 only, and they cannot project Adobe RGB 1998. Um, color management of your monitor. So this is the device that we recommend. It is was previously known as the X-Rite i1 Display Pro. Um, yes, uh, many people ask me about color monkeys and data color spiders. Um, I have never had very good res um, results with those products, and I would rather step up and buy a more expensive product that I know absolutely works and will provide a um, validatable color calibration rather than providing me with 
just kind of a process and I don't really know what happens at the end, uh, which is what happens on the lower priced um, products like the Color Monkey, which is now the uh, display studio type product. So uh, this is the minimum device that I really recommend. There is one more that's more expensive. It's about $319. Uh, it has a more sensitive and more accurate sensor in it. And it will calibrate monitors that have a NIT rating up to 2,000 NITs. But this is the primary device that we sell. Um, if you want to step up to the more expensive device, you can. But it's really not necessary if you're calibrating a standard monitor. Most monitors are only going to go up to three, four, or 500 NITs. And this device will handle those monitors just fine. Um, so... That was steps one and two. I want to just kind of set the tone here as to why um, uh, the steps that I'm going to be talking about are important. So with color management, uh, those two words really strike fear in the hearts of most photographers. Most people don't want to, uh, I guess, Historically, most people uh, present these issues very in a very complex way. They use a lot of fancy words. I try to make it very relatable. So hopefully uh, this conversation will um, clear up some of the mysteries that you might have uh, run into uh, in your career. Uh, but color management really is what allows us to achieve consistent, reliable, repeatable, and controllable results. I don't like guessing at what is on the computer screen and what's going to come out of the printer. I do not want to make 10 prints to get a good one. I want to make a print in one print that's either perfect or really close to perfect. I might make a second print. Um, most of my prints are made in one print. Uh, I want this to be enjoyable. I want it to be fun. And if you're going to make 10 prints, I like them really to all be 10 perfect prints rather than nine failures and one good one. So color management helps us achieve that, right? Um, the other thing is a lot of people just feel they buy a printer, they plug it in, uh, they put a piece of paper, they push print, and most people fail, right? And the reason is that they just think the printer somehow is going to read their mind and understand what they want. And what they see on the monitor is really what's going to come out of the printer. And that's not really true. There is a disconnect. And the reality is that we have to learn how to use our printers and the driver and understand all of those um, subtleties. Otherwise, you're not going to get good prints. And the interesting thing to me is People spend a lot of time learning how to use their camera. They spend a lot of time learning how to use lighting and how to shoot. And they go on trips and they go on all sorts of expeditions. And they spend a lot of money on learning how to use Photoshop. But when it comes to their printer, they just don't think there's anything to learn. And I assure you, assure you that there is. Um, also, photography, to me, has always been a combination of art and science. And color management is the science part. So the art part is your ability to capture an image that you're so proud of that you want to show it, you want to share it, you want to sell it, and then how you're going to display it. And if you're going to print it, color management is very important. So at a very basic level, in terms of color management, we have two devices to manage. It's our monitor, and then it's really the paper with the printer, right? So... How I like to explain it is that your files on your computer, it's getting sent to the monitor. Your files on the computer, it gets sent to the printer. These two devices are not connected to each other whatsoever. Your monitor is not connected to your printer. Think about it. If you make a print and you look at it and say it's too dark, honestly, that's my number one call. My prints are coming out too dark. I must need to calibrate my printer. It's not true. Your monitor is too bright or the light that you're looking at the print under is too dark. So if we calibrate the monitor, it's calibrated to a standard. And that standard has been set by the International Color Co Consortium. We see those letters all the time, .icc. That's the International Color Consortium. So there's a standard. 
we calibrate our monitor, and then we create a custom pro profile for our printer. And now we know that our monitor is projecting color accurately and at the right brightness. We know the printer's printing to the best that it possibly can, and that these two devices that are completely different, speak totally different languages, are now at least to the best of their ability speaking this same language. So a profile, I like to use analogies. Um, it's just like a pair of glasses. Um, so when we calibrate a monitor, the device goes on the, um, on the monitor, you know, the uh, colorimeter, we call it, for a, um, for a monitor. A color spectrophotometer is what we use for measuring uh, paper profiles. Colorimeter, like the color, you know, the uh, Calibrite color checker display pro goes on your monitor. The software flashes colors. The colorimeter senses those colors, then compares them to a lookup table. And the profile is the mathematical difference between how your monitor is projecting color and how it's supposed to be according to the ICC standard. It's exactly like going to the eye doctor. So my glasses are the mathematical difference between how my eyes see and how I'm supposed to see according to the medical standard of 2020 vision. And we're doing the same thing when we're calibrating a monitor. So think of the profile as a custom pair of glasses for your monitor. And when we do a custom paper profile, we're creating a custom pair of glasses for the printer and how it's printing on a specific paper. Every paper has its own color fingerprint, which is why we need a profile for every paper on our printer. So uh, I get asked a lot about color space, uh, and I just want to touch on it for a few minutes. Uh, we have three color spaces available to us, and there's a lot of confusion as to which one is which and why we would use one over the other. Uh, the first two are sRGB and, and Adobe RGB 1998. sRGB was our first color space. It was created in 1994 by Microsoft and has been uh, it was created specifically for being able to uh, uh, render the maximum amount of color that photographic film could represent, that technology. So it's great for C prints or what some of the, your online services might call as photo prints or chromogenic prints. Um, it's really good for skin tones. It's, um, but it's the smallest color space we have. Adobe RGB 1998 is what we use for digital fine art printmaking. It was established by Adobe in 1998. Um, uh, contrary to what I do get, um, I get calls from people saying, hey, I heard you say Adobe RGB 1998 was bigger and that I should be using that for my printing, but I just took a class and that person said, um, oh, sRGB stands for super RGB and is much bigger than Adobe RGB 1998. And Adobe <laughs> RGB 1998 was discontinued in 1998. That is not true. I can super. tell you that you are. That is not true. <laughs> Never heard that super. <laughs> yeah, sRGB, super RGB. So, so, uh, so on the left is sRGB. The center um, shows how much bigger Adobe RGB 1998 is. It is uh, about 35% more color. And then the far right is a 2D uh, graphical representation, which you'll usually see in magazines and such because it's easy to render. Um, to do this, I'm using a, a program called ColorThink Pro. It's a professional profile and color space analyzing tool where I could visualize um, the colors that are in a in a file and compare them to different color spaces. So, so if you had an older Mac uh, pre-2015, it would be projecting sRGB. Um, BenQ monitors obviously project the larger color space. So can I ask a quick question then? By all means. So knowing that Adobe RGB 1998 is a bigger color space than sRGB, why do a lot of the output houses tell you to save your file as an sRGB file? Mm, to be economical in terms of uh, the size of the files uh, that they're getting. Right. Also, if you're having photo prints done, quote photo prints that are mm -hmm. on chromogenic uh, paper, uh, which is basically mini lab paper, you know, the same paper 
you know, it's exposed with lasers and it goes through a chemical process. Um, Adobe RGB 1998 uh, can't be represented on on those files. Seems like um, they're they're doing it um, for their own workflow. The reality is that if they're doing fine art uh, digital prints on a Epson or a Canon inkjet printer, um, Adobe RGB 1998 is preferred. Uh, but also, you know, we really while I'm saying these things, it really is dependent upon what you're doing. For instance, if you're shooting a wedding and your skin tones, sRGB is pretty much fine because you're not getting a lot of crazy colors. You have black tuxedos, white shirts, a white wedding dress. There's not a ton of color. Very rarely are is you're, are you going to be approaching Adobe RGB 1998 colors in a traditional American wedding. You know, for instance, you start getting into um, you know, the East Indian weddings and, you know, where there's like a golds and just tremendous color, then Adobe RGB 1998 would be more appropriate. But um, the, the, the labs are going to be, they're going to do whatever they can to have a more economical workflow. So it's their choice. But for me doing my own work, um, I standardize everything for Adobe RGB 1998. And mind you, these are all choices, right? Um, I maintain that nobody, if you know how to print and you follow the six steps, you can make far better prints than a commercial lab because you're controlling the process. They don't know what your original file was supposed to look like. I'm into control. I want you to be able to um, look at your computer screen, say, I want that, push the button, and that's what's going to come out. But there is a lot of convenience in using a commercial lab. So. Right. Um, so this is the third color space, very controversial. It's ProPhoto RGB. As you can see, it's huge. It's much larger than Adobe RGB 1998 and sRGB. And there's no monitor that can see it. And there's no printer that can print it. So, um, you know, I go to, when I, when I go to a lot of events, I generally get somebody that says, oh, I don't, you know, they're, they're People use a lot of judgment, right? They use a lot of judgmental terms. I let people say, well, I don't consider you a real photographer unless you're working, you know, in pro photo. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, it's a theoretical color space. We can't really use it. And yes, Lightroom defaults to it because Adobe wants you to be able to have all the colors in your file that could potentially be there. But very rarely do uh, colors occur in nature that are outside of Adobe RGB 1998. And really from a printing standpoint, we're limited to what the paper can resolve. Right. Um, and there aren't many colors that go outside of Adobe RGB 1998. And in fact, our paper cannot really render full Adobe RGB 1998, but that's for kind of another time. The one thing I do wanna really say about this is that every color management expert I've, I've talk to says pro photo because it's so big it's really not good for skin tones if you're doing skin tones really should be srgb which was optimized for skin tones or adobe rgb 1998 so so another kind of thought on this is um obviously we know that when we export and we save an image from lightroom that's when we choose either adobe rgb 1998 or srgb but I would hope that in the future, Adobe would give us the option to set the color settings of, say, Lightroom Classic to, say, Adobe RGB from the get-go. So you don't um, have to just export at the end. You know, I'm not Adobe. I can't speak for them. Um, I set my export, all my export presets mm -hmm. for the purpose in which I'm going to be using the file. So if I'm going to be Using the file on the web, I set it to sRGB, and I have a and I have a preset set for that. If I'm going to print, I set it for Adobe RGB 1998. You know, it's interesting that the manufacturers will very often make decisions for us. Um, I like to make decisions for myself. So, sure. yep. <laughs> but when people say, you know, ProPhoto is the biggest, so we should be using that. I'm okay, fine. You're just going to be creating bigger files. You're creating a file that will handle will contain that larger color space right, right. so and, and another thing i would add is if you were to save a pro photo say you know rgb um, tiff or jpeg and you send it to an output house the, 
they might not even tell you, but they would convert it down to Adobe oh, yeah. RGB or sRGB automatically, right? Yes, they'll scale it to what whatever their workflow is. It depends on what software they're using and all that kind of stuff. And look, uh, the output houses have their place. But, um, but for me, I'm all about helping individuals uh, produce the best work they can. And I certainly work with many of the, uh, especially locally here in Los Angeles, many commercial labs who do uh, have us provide monitor calibration services and custom profiles. They're going to do an excellent job for you. Right. Uh, when you're using the larger houses, it's more of an assembly line. You know, they're not really looking at every image. They're, it's being processed through some sort of software. So, you know, again, I'm all about control. Anyway, um, Great. Uh, I just want to, I see it's 136. I want to continue clicking through because it's very easy for me to get distracted. Right. And, and um, do know you can go beyond the hour, of course. So. Well, you know, I'd like to, you know. Anyway, okay. Thank so um, so here is monitor color spaces, right? So we have uh, BenQ uh, WRGB 1998 versus Apple P3. So you can see that both color spaces are very different, right? And that's why I say Apple monitors or even, like I got a call from somebody yesterday who was saying, well, what about this $1,300 uh, monitor they have at the Apple store that's LG? It's P3 color space. It is different. And interestingly enough is that I've had customers come to me with a bright red streak right in the middle of their artwork, of their file, and they'll show me a print and say, look, it's printing rust. Why is that so different? And I take the same file, put it on my BenQ monitor, and it's showing it precisely the way it's printing. And that's why I feel it's important to have a monitor with the with a color space that's appropriate for editing digital images for printing, right? That's that's the whole key to this. The seven thousand dollar Apple monitor is to me not appropriate for printing. The BenQ, if you want a thirty two inch monitor, the two thousand dollar BenQ monitor is far more appropriate for somebody who wants to print. So Andrew and I were talking the other day um, about how to set up your Photoshop settings um, uh, in the color settings panel under the edit menu. Uh, this will be available later on. Um, I have it saved as a slide. I can always send it later. Um, I set my working space to Adobe RGB 1998. I tell Photoshop to tell me um, when I have a profile mismatch, whereas, for instance, I get a file that's sRGB and my working space is Adobe RGB 1998, it's going to give me a little window that says, what do you want to do? Well, if it's sRGB, I might as well just leave it alone. Do not convert to Adobe RGB 1998 because I can't add any more color. It's already a smaller color space. Unless I wanted to composite an, an Adobe RGB 1998 image along with it, then I would convert it to Adobe RGB 1998. So I have the headroom to be able to bring in that other file and not clip out any colors. So this is how I set my Photoshop settings in the, um, in the color settings under the edit menu. Uh, so here's number three. Enough about number two. This is the fun part. Um, unfortunately, I don't get to spend as much time on it as I would I would normally. This is a two-hour presentation, I assure you. Uh, there is a lot for me to talk about paper. Um, I break down paper into two general categories, photograph general purpose, which is all resin-coated papers and cheap matte papers. Those are not papers for exhibition gallery museum quality. Most of the customers I work with are printing, they're fine art photographers printing for exhibition. I deal with commercial photographers who, oh, maybe they just want a paper that's really durable. Epson Ultra Premium Photo Paper Luster or our Arista Luster Paper or any luster um, resin-coated paper, which is a plastic-coated paper is appropriate for that. But if you want to get better results, I go for what I call the fine art or transformational papers. These are papers that would in fact be accepted by a gallery museum. They're going to last longer. You're going to have richer, more beautiful images, depth and dimension, more vibrant color. But, but in particular, 
Um, there are papers that are available. You know, there's matte papers with a lot of texture. And um, I've created images on matte paper that look so three-dimensional. People are looking at it, trying to pick things off the page. Same thing. Uh, it depends on the subject matter, though. For me, I'm at a point with paper because I've printed on everything and I've done so much work with individuals that when I shoot, I know what paper I'm going to print on. And it is very much part of my pre-visualization pre process. Um, and I think is a very unique conversation to have because most people are more interested in the gear. I say, you know, photographers really do suffer from what I call gas gear acquisition syndrome, right? They're more apt to want to acquire things that are professional looking. Um, and paper kind of gets left on the side. For me, paper is really much more important a conversation than what camera you're using, what lens you're using, or any of the gear that you have. So quick question. Um, if we go back to the last slide if you had to limit it to two papers what would you say are your absolute favorite papers for a range of color and you know depth that you just think is best for fine art museum quality print <laughs> two i get asked More that question a lot don't do that to me <laughs> <laughs> don't do that to me um we have hundreds of papers available and really the right paper to use is the one that you've chosen uh, to based on your taste, right? I've got uh, probably 20 favorites. Um, uh, I'm not going to say the two that I like the best because that wouldn't be fair. I've got to be a bit diplomatic sure. because we, you know, we do represent all of, you know, we've got, I think I've got eight, one, two, three, yeah, I've got eight brands of paper here. And within each brand, there are, there are specific papers that I love, right? And I've, there's some of them are right here. We have Hunter Millie Fine Art Baryta Satin, Cants on Arch 88, Gilford Smooth Pearl, Moab Juniper Baryta Rag, you know, uh, Nova. I mean, I have specifically chosen these papers for these specific images, right? And, and I wouldn't print these individual images on any other paper. These are now objects to me. And the paper's part of the composition, right? right. So um, the answer to the question really, though, is this. This is my next slide. Um, I perform a service uh, for our customers. It's $99, and it is called an inkjet paper psychotherapy session. I do these all the time. I have been doing them for years. It is the only way I can answer the question of what paper should I use. It's the only way. And so I do them online, uh, remotely with people, with folks all over the world. Uh, when you order it online from our website, I uh, go to our website, search the word, uh, just put in psycho or psychotherapy. It'll come up. Um, and, uh, and what will happen is I will uh, be made aware that you've placed an order. I will contact you, I'll set up a zoom call. And uh, we'll have an hour conversation. We'll just, we're going to talk about your history and printing, um, what you think you like and don't like, what you've used in the past. If you're in the dark room, love to hear all the papers people used to use. I can recite the technical specifications of every paper uh, in the photo industry, darkroom or digital, made in the last 50 years. Um, yes, I do sometimes forget people's names. I apologize. But okay, so <laughs> I do know the technical specification of all the papers. So um, bit of a dialogue and therefore question. So I wanted to kind of bring you into that. So Alan originally said, uh, what paper for Milky Way photos? And then Veronica jumped in and said, um, I'm a bit biased, but think the Hanumule, and I'm not sure if that's how you say it, photo rag metallic is an excellent option. Mm -hmm. So photo rag metallic is a very, very unique paper. Um, there's nothing like it on the market. It was introduced a few years ago at Photokina. Um, it is for some images just has a beautiful depth and dimension to it. Uh, most metallic papers are resin coated papers. Uh, this is the first fine art archival paper on the market. And, um, everything just looks like a beautiful gift coming out of the printer. Uh, it has a silver metallic pigment. So it's a little off putting when you look at the edges sometimes because the, it's got a, basically a gray base. 
but uh, many oftentimes I'll, I'll cut the base off. Uh, Hanamule did recently release that paper in their, in their little custom, uh, they have these little four by six gift tins with the little rounded edges. I put those in my, in my desktop printer and they're just gorgeous. It's a beautiful presentation. So yes, I agree with Ver Veronica on, uh, on the Hanamule photo rag metallic. What was the other, uh, and there's the, another question, uh, he didn't give his name for the profile, but it says, I'm trying to choose a new printer. I have a Canon in mind. Does that confine me to using Canon papers? Uh, good question. Uh, the inkjet papers are designed uh, to be universal. Canon printers are, you can use any of the paper brands that I've mentioned on a Canon or an Epson or an HP printer. They, the inkjet coatings are designed to be universally used on all the machines. Uh, there is a bit of mythology out there, uh, especially, you know, with uh, a lot of people say, well, I have an Epson printer. I just use Epson paper because it's more compatible. Well, that's not really true. Epson paper can be used on any printer. Canon paper can be used on any printer. Um, uh, we don't really even carry uh, much Canon paper because it's just kind of a duplication of everything else we have. Um, Epson and Canon are not paper manufacturers, so they're carrying a paper brand to go along with their printer. Um, but no, you are not limited to Canon paper. Uh, you can use any brand by all means. And uh, this uh, service that we offer here is the best way I know of to help people decide what paper's right for them. And uh, in fact, when I perform these uh, sessions, uh, which we affectionately call an inkjet paper psychotherapy session, uh, you will provide me with a file and I will print that file on my uh, personal Canon Pro 4100 printer here, all with custom profiles and send them back to you in the mail. And then we will have a, a follow up conversation uh, to help you decide if you, you know, I mean, really the proof is in just viewing them, right? Which one do I like? But I like to have that follow up conversation to discuss the technical details of those papers. Um, I also perform them at our retail store, which is on Sunset Boulevard near Western. Um, I have a full demonstration area there with both Canon and Epson printers. And I have access to all uh, the samples of all of the papers we have from all eight of the brands of paper that we have. So this is by far the best way I know of to answer the question of what paper should I use? Sure. Great. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about printers. So um, choosing a printer that suits your needs is obviously, you know, paramount, right? What, and these are some of the things to consider, you know, what size prints do I want to make? How much room do I have, you know, to really house a printer? Because some of them could be quite large. How often will I be printing? What type of paper will I be using? How long do I want my prints to last? And then of course, ink costs. So these are four of the printers that we carry. We sell quite often. The, on the desktop printers, you have printers that are basically will produce images that are 13 inch wide as a max, and then 17 inch wide as a maximum. 13 inch wide printers generally cost more per milliliter by double than the 17 inch printers. So while the 17 inch printers cost more, um, they generally come with more ink and uh, print for print, they're going to cost more, less per milliliter to operate. So I generally, if people are looking for a desktop printer, my recommendation is the Pro 1000 or the, uh, from Canon or the Surecolor P900. But then again, I have some people that they have a little tiny desk and they don't have a lot of room. Uh, and in that case, the, you know, the Image ImageProGraph Pro 300 or the Epson Surecolor P700 are good choices. But I generally, just because it's literally double per milliliter for the cost of the ink on the smaller printers, I prefer the 17 inch wide uh, printers. And they give you the same full um, features and such uh, in terms of the drivers as the large format printers do. So it's size, how much space do you have, all that kind of stuff. Um, now on the wide format printers, which is really kind of more of our customer, uh, we sell both Canon and Epson. 
And uh, the pros to a larger printer like this is that they are more efficient for larger prints, right? I mean, you could print up to, you know, on the 2100, uh, 24 inches wide or the Pro 4100 up to 44 inches wide. They also have 60 inch printers available, uh, which we sell quite a few of as well. Uh, these printers are designed to be serviced and repaired. The smaller ones are not. Um, the smaller ones, when they die, they're really designed to be disposable and replaceable as much uh, most of the things in our digital word, world are. Uh, these printers are also much faster. When I do demos uh, and printing workshops, I much prefer to use one of these printers. I could make several prints on these printers, even feeding sheets one at a time before uh, you know some of the smaller printers even get started. So um, they're so much more efficient. They're lower cost per milliliter for ink. Um, yeah, they take up more space in terms of sheets. You can only feed one sheet at a time. You can't do borderless printing on sheets and you can't do small pieces of paper. But um, obviously these are the, the same types of printers that commercial labs are using. And uh, we sell a lot of them to fine art photographers who want to print their own work. Um, and of course, colleges and universities, et cetera. So, and I certainly work with people all the time and advise them and on all of the um, uh, intricacies, quirks um, of all of these printers. And uh, I know them all really, really well. It's my life. Uh, so here's number five. We're almost done. Uh, it's custom profiling service. So you can buy a device that'll, that you can create a custom profile. But our device is a Barbieri, um, what's called a Barbieri LFP QB. This is the latest iteration of this product from Barbieri. It's, this is the top level paper profiling device in the world. And uh, the center uh, image in the center, this is a sample color patch chart that we would have you print out and send to us or bring to us in the store. And then just like your monitor, uh, where I describe that process where the colors flash on the screen and the colorimeter uh, scans in those colors and it compares them to a lookup table. Same thing here. Uh, you're printing these color patches out uh, without color management under our directions. You have to do it a special way. You just can't print them out in Photoshop or Lightroom. They won't come out right. Um, you have to print them out a special way and then you send them to us and this device then scans in those colors every single one of 2,108 patches and then uh, we use special software and create a custom profile. Um, and uh, it's very interesting to me when people ask me, well, what's really, what am I gonna see as the difference? You're gonna see more color gamut. You're gonna see, uh, you could even see a sharper image. I've shown people samples and they're like, wow, it, it even seems sharper. Uh, you're gonna see more shadow detail, greater uh, density in the blacks, uh, smoother tonal transitions because you have more colors. Um, but it also linearizes grayscale as well, which uh, for black and white printing is really critical. And we charge $99 per uh, paper printer profile. So if you have a paper on multiple printers, you need a profile for each printer. If you have multiple papers on one printer, each paper would have its own uh, corresponding profile. Uh, and here is a bit of an illustration here of what it means for black and white. I have a real live print of this that I bring with me to my workshops and my seminars. And when I show this print to people uh, and I say, what do you think? They'll say, oh, it looks great. And I'm like, great. You use the word great. They're like, yes, it looks great. It's a digital image, a digital uh, infrared image I took in Bodhi, uh, obviously a recognizable subject. Um, and then we create a custom profile and then this is the result. So I have both of these prints. The one on the left was created with the manufacturer's generic profile off of their website on my printer. And it has a noticeable green cast. Well, you wouldn't have seen the difference if I didn't tell you and show you that was there was a difference. So a lot of people's um, position on profiles is that, well, if I don't know the difference, why would I spend the money or take the time to do it, right? Well, I like to know that what I'm printing is perfect. I want to take any uncertainty or variables out of my process and know that my printer is printing perfectly. 
Um, when people call me and say, hey, my black and white prints are coming out a little green or blue or cyan or or magenta, I'm like, it's a profiling issue. And 100% of the time, we create a custom profile, it goes away. And the reason is that no two printers print exactly alike. That's the problem. I've just did some profiles, same paper on multiple desktop printers. Uh, it doesn't matter, Epson or Canon. The colors, many of the colors on this chart could be five to ten percent off per printer. They're not exact. Every printer is a little different, just like everybody's eyes are different. Um, people ask me, well, what does it mean when a color's at a gamut? Well, on the left hand side, you can see there's magenta and cyan that's totally out of gamut for the paper profile. And that's another disconnect, right? We talk about um, soft proofing where we're applying the paper profile to our monitor. That's important so that we can get that one step closer to having some predictability in terms of our result. This particular customer um, was printing on a specific paper and was saying, why isn't the color coming out right? And I looked at it in ColorThink Pro and I'm look I looked at it and said, take a look here. Your color is so far out of gamut that paper cannot render that color accurately. It is within Adobe RGB 1998. You can see it on your monitor, but you cannot print it. And that's where our choice of perceptual or relative color metric comes into play. It's telling the print driver how to deal with that out of gamut color. That's where our pr a better profile comes into play. On the right-hand side, you see here where the wireframe is one of our custom profiles for the very same paper on the very same printer versus a generic profile, which is the colored space. So you can see that at the bottom, which is where all the blacks are and the shadow detail, where we're just capturing more information on the paper than with a generic profile. And here's it. This is the second to last slide, lighting. So this is absolutely critical. And one of the things I'm always uh, fighting against with people because they don't realize that, um, you know, your lighting in your office is not 5,000 K, which is, uh, you know, with a high color rendering index, our standard that we've set up in the industry for viewing prints to compare to our monitor is bright sunlight, high noon or 5,000 K otherwise known, you know, also is D 50. Um, uh, I get people that will call me up and say, you know, my prints look really dark um, and they're yellow and I'll get on Zoom and they'll be looking at them with a little yellow lamp and a little yellow lampshade. <laughs> and I'm like, turn on a light and, and, and a cooler light, right? So the what we really need to be cognizant of when we're viewing prints and comparing them to our monitor is what the viewing conditions are. And while we do sell G GTI viewing stations um, and they're not inexpensive, uh, you can go to Home Depot and get some Cree lights um, that are 5,000 K they have a, or other brands. Just make sure the color rendering index is, is high, you know, in the nineties and um, and, you know, you can move them back and forth or, you, you know, make sure they're dimmable, just create a standard viewing environment so that um, when you're looking at your prints, you're not looking at them with a tungsten light that's very yellow or an LED light that might be too cool. So, and that really does close the loop. So, ta-da! Oh my gosh, I got through in like, what was that, 50 minutes. Excellent. It's like perfect. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna, I wanna stop sharing. Um, okay, so go back. I'm gonna to go that. back to uh, Chrome now, right? Well, I switched okay. us back to us, the view of us, yeah. Good, our, okay. Our beautiful <laughs> portraits. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm glad I got done in, in, within a reasonable amount of time. So we've got, um, you know, what, 15 more minutes officially, um, we can go over. Are there questions that people would like yeah. to ask? Thank Please you, Veronica. She said, brilliant. I'm, I don't know if I'm brilliant, but at least I, I try to give good, reliable information that's <clears throat> understandable. Right. And, um, and, uh, everything about, about my presentations is really um, providing people with knowledge and education information to help them be successful, right? I mean, I know what I know, and I'm always learning too. I'm not somebody that's like, I just, this is it, right? I'm done. 
I'm always testing. I'm always um, experiencing new people in, you know, every day I'm, I'm meeting new people and, and others have contributed to my success and knowledge. Um, I know art is on, I want to give a shout out to art. Uh, he has a YouTube channel is art swan saying uh, it's art is right. He, he and I have connected recently. He's a brand ambassador for BenQ and Calibrite um, and Adobe. And, uh, and he gives really good, solid information on monitor calibration. He's doing a lot of testing on the new Apple computers, uh, the new Apple laptops and such. Uh, really trying to get his head wrapped around, like I do, real world. I have tested this. This is my result. I know this works. That's the kind of guy he is. And, and, and he puts up new videos and he revises his, um, his uh, videos with new and updated information, right? So um, I also urge everybody, when you see information on the internet, um, please look at the date that it was created, right? Um, I'm always uh, helping people wade through uh, information that's either old or outdated, right? They say, well, this program, this is, I'm like, look at the date of the video. I mean, it's like six years ago. We've had three, four different versions of the software since then. I was going to say that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, for a lot of these Photoshop instructors as well, because they put out books and then there's an update mm -hmm. with new features. And all of a sudden, you know, they have to rush to kind of send out another book, you know, so. Yeah. So that's why I like YouTube a lot too, because YouTube has up to date information, you know. So any other um, specific questions coming through that I could answer? Well, there was uh, one. Alan asked a question earlier, but I think um, you pretty much answered it. But uh, when you do the um, custom profile, how many different paper profiles do you get? I believe you said one, right? Yeah. I mean, look, it takes – we've the, the machine is just mind-boggling – expensive. We put a lot of time and effort into perfecting this process. $99 is one profile. Um, right. I have some customers that they have one paper. Um, they only want one paper. They're never going to, you know, that's it. Draw a line in the sand. Um, uh, then I have some people that have four or five papers or six papers. Um, I have one customer that has 30. I, I feel like a bartender. I got to cut him off. Right. But he's like, I have seen the difference. <laughs> and this is a, a, a guy who um, he's retired and he's printing for other people. He just, I just want to know I'm getting the best result. And I know with your profile, I'm going to get that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, though, you can go to the manufacturer's website, download their profile, and you could be quite happy doing that. Um, and, you know, while I have presented the six steps, I'm not autocratic enough to say these are not negotiable, right? I know a lot of people that have, uncalibrated Apple monitors that um, and they're using manufacturers profiles or just a generic, like I'm just going to choose El Epson velvet fine art paper. And um, you know, as a profile and they're happy, right? I mean, who am I going to say that they're not happy? Um, are you still there? I'm here. Oh, okay. You just, I was just over to another solo other, like, mode for, I need to see you, man. I, I need to respond to somebody. I can't just talk to myself. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that I know people that say, look, I've, I, I have a little pro Canon pro 100 die base printer. I'm using Canon pro luster resin coated paper. I just put it on auto and I'm getting the best gallery exhibition museum quality prints you've ever seen. And the reality is all of those terms are mutually exclusive. Dye-based prints are not gallery museum quality. They're going to fade faster than pigment-based prints. The paper you're using is going to fall apart in about 15 years, maybe sooner. It's a resin-coated paper. It's not designed for longevity. Um, but they're happy. And who am I to say that they shouldn't be, right? But I would like to make people better, right? And I want to give people confidence and being able to, you know, like I said, have reliable, consistent, controllable, and repeatable results. What I see on my computer screens, what comes out. And recently, you and I have had this conversation. I have had it with others. Is the software 
both on the color management side and the printing side, there's so many options, right? And, um, and it's hard to know, you know, which things to choose. So when you buy the colorimeter from us, the, you know, Calibrite uh, Color Checker Display Pro, it comes with a manual written by me, right? A step-by-step 27-page hard copy manual with big circles and arrows and says, click this button, go to the next page, right? Because this stuff's written by engineers. Um, and, um, and then if you have a question or a problem, guess what? You get to call me. I'm, I'm your lifeline. I, I refuse to let people fail when it comes to this stuff. Great. We have a couple of questions too. Okay. So, Fire away. Um, they didn't give permission to stream yard, but uh, Facebook user says a question from experience. If a magazine is asking to convert a retouch file to CMYK for printing, is it normal to ask for the printer type ICC profile and paper type? Are there standard ICC profiles that magazines use? So um, uh, this is a moving target, right? It really depends. Typically, if it's a magazine, yeah, I would get their, uh, I would acquire their profile, load it into your system and soft proof with it. Um, some of them just don't, they don't do that, right? And, and if you wanted to have a conversation with a commercial lab to get their profile, they're not going to give it to you. They're just like, give us your file. We're going to make a print, right? right? Because really from a commercial lab, I'm talking about the big guys, right? Um, they're going to, their, their motto is basically you send me a file. I want to provide you with a print that you will accept and pay for it. Right. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it's gotta be one that you're, it's acceptable. Right. Uh, when it comes to a magazine, uh, I'd like to say that it's really exact. Um, the reality is that this could be a moving target. could be the, you know, depends on the paper stock they're using all sorts of things. Um, all I say is that that's where the proofing process comes into play, right? Where you provide them with the file, they make a print, they provide you with the proof, they send it to you, you look at it, go, yes, that's what I want, and then that's what they make. Uh, whenever you release that file to somebody, you're releasing a certain amount of control. So, now, now a question connected to that that I have is... Um, oh, you're so not I allowed to ask questions. That's for them. I've already asked a few. I've already asked. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, so, you know, I've been working since the nineties, uh, you know, working on images and photos for advertising, whatnot. And um, so, yeah, CMYK, it was predominantly what they would use for printing for magazines. But nowadays, is there a lot of different um, printers for publications that use uh, RGB printing now? Um, you know what, honestly, it's not my world. Um, right. I really focus on people that are doing fine art printing. Um, when this comes up, I simply tell, urge people to work with whoever's going to be printing the magazine or the book, for instance, okay. and, and yeah. ask them for their guidance. Many oftentimes people get back to me and say, yes, they provided me with a profile, but there's so many variables that, um, you know, you're only going to get in the ballpark again. It's the proof. And then if you take any print and just walk all over your house with it, it's going to look different under in different every lighting. room. It's going to look different in all sorts of lighting conditions. Uh, standard, again, is bright sunlight, high noon. If you go into the shade, that's a much cooler light. People say, oh, I just go next to my window where it's diffused light. Not the right light. Bring it out in bright sunlight. You'll see a totally different print. That's right. Just be careful about where you're viewing it. Um, for instance, at Freestyle, I have a GTI light box. I move the print out of the box six inches. It totally changes because now it goes from a correct lighting environment to the whatever lighting's in the store, right? And then papers with optical brighteners react differently under fluorescence and different types of lighting than uh, conditions than if there aren't any, if it looks different under tongue. I mean, it's just, there's sure. all these variables that happen with paper. So we have a, a question from Joyce. Uh, is there a printing quality difference between Canon and Epson Pro printers? Um, so I get asked this a lot as well. Um, my answer is they both make excellent printers. I mean, if I, if I, uh, I have many oftentimes did side-by-side -side comparisons 
Epson printer, custom profile, Canon printer, custom profile. I mix them up. I write on the back. I put them in my box and say, which one's which? I never had anybody really be able to pick one over the other, right? It's like this Canon versus Nikon battle that's been going on right. for generations. Sure. Really, they're both great printers. Um, they do have, uh, you know, all sorts of different, there, there are differences and I have no problem and I'm always eager to talk about those things offline. But um, uh, the reality is we sell a lot of both. Uh, and they both make excellent prints. Um, and unless you're like me, where I might be able to tell just because I know the characteristics, but uh, in the final analysis, they both, they're just, they're both beautiful printers. They both, they both make beautiful printers. And, uh, Donna Marie says, calibrate a Christmas gift to myself. I'm on it. Yay. So, new information for her. So uh, just to also kind of highlight that Calibrite is uh, x Write is the company that everybody is known for generations or at least a generation. Uh, they have moved the photo monitor calibration products to a new, pro a new company called Calibrite, um, which uh, is committed to continuing those products um, under the, they've kind of focused on the color checker brand because that's really super popular. Um, and it's the same product. So if you download the new Calibrite software, it'll work on your old X-Rite device. Um, the old X-Rite, the, the, uh, the, the new devices are the same. There's just a branding change. So they'll work with the old X-Rite software. Um, and, you know, uh, also the new Apple computers between the M1 chips and Monterey, they're reaping havoc with all sorts of software out there that we're still learning how to get through all that. And there's all these bug fixes and updates coming through. So and then we have a, a comment from Dennis Dunbar, another friend in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So no Dennis. Uh, well, hi Dennis. So when converting RGB to CMYK, it is essential to have some good idea which profile the printer is going to use because CMYK is about ink on paper. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the ink or the paper, et cetera, it's a blind guess. Mm -hmm. So That's more of a comment because he does a lot of things for print. Yeah. Um, so it is a good idea, but sometimes we don't have that level of control. And we just got to, you know, people ask me, well, who's the best online service? And I'm like, you know what? If I sent the same file to six of them, I'm going to get six prints back. I know that because I've done it, right? You'd like to think that there's all one standard, and there is, but sometimes you're limited to the operator or the maintenance right. of the machine. I mean, there's all sorts of Variables. different factors in there. And um, and um, like I said, I'm I'm personally committed to helping people print themselves and uh, for the lab customers that I have committed to making, you know, giving them the tools to make the best possible prints that they can. Um, people right. ask me all the time. I have a, an image. I see it on my monitor. How do I know that when I send it to the lab, that's what I'm going to get back? And the answer is you don't. All right. That's why having your own printer is great because you can do it right there. You can look at the image, edit it, make a print and go, that's what I wanted move on to the next print, right? Not make adjustment after adjustment after adjustment. That's not the way to do it in the digital world. We don't need really to do test prints anymore. If every if you follow the six steps. Excellent. So let's go over um, some of the links of yours. So first is Freestyle Photo Biz. So that's your uh, company, right? That you yes. Yes, absolutely. And there's lots of articles on our website uh, that uh, we and and just as a note, um, while I'm here talking about our digital products and printers and such, um, we also are very big in the analog well world. We've really committed ourselves to continuing the, the legacy uh, products uh, associated with film based photography. We sell darkroom products to schools all over the world and film sales are absolutely phenomenal in the last year and are continuing to, right. to just skyrocket. So um, we are not a camera store though. Well, you're not going to come to us for cameras and lenses and stuff. Basically think of us as uh, film and anybody who wants to make a print on a piece of paper, whether it's darkroom or digital, we have the products 
that you would, um, we carry the products that associated with that right? We're not a camera lens company, although we do sell Holga cameras and pinhole cameras and, uh, and large format cameras and, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So, right. uh, film cameras, of course. Right. And, um, you can find Eric on Facebook at eric.joseph.14. Um, and you, you post like news and events that you're having on. on that. Yeah. I keep it very much to like, if I'm at an opening um, uh, like this weekend, uh, tomorrow there's going to be an opening a bit building bridges gallery. Uh, I know all 10 of the artists that are there and I like to support them. So I'll post things like that. I'll certainly right. post post when I'm doing workshops and events, I'm attending trade shows, um, any upcoming uh, happenings that I will be uh, performing, um, I promote via Facebook. Excellent, absolutely. And then uh, your Instagram. I'd YouTube. like to. I'd like to say I keep up with that. Mm, I don't as much. Um, you know, it's all of our personal preferences. Um, sure. I will post images up there from time to time. Um, um, I don't post there often, but right. maybe I'll start doing that more often. We'll see. Sure. And then there's the uh, the bio of you on the LA center for photography, right? Yeah. LA center, LA for, center for, yeah. LA center of photography. So my bio's there. I'm, I'm an instructor there. Um, I'm, I teach uh, a class very popular called the fine art of digital printmaking. And I teach it many times throughout the year. And then certainly for them. And I post other um, online workshops that I do via Zoom uh, on paper, and I'm sure I'll be doing something like this in the future. Uh, also, color management. So I'm always, always, you know, doing my part to educate people. So, uh, and then before we get to uh, the most important, your email, so people can contact you. There's a couple comments. Donna Marie asks, uh, "Will you be attending imaging?" I guess the uh, imaging USA. Uh, no. Um, and I'm not really sure if it's going to happen. I've talked to a lot of vendors and uh, they're kind of feeling like it's too soon. I don't know, but we are not going to do that show. Uh, my next event will be a uh, medium photo festival in San Diego. Uh, we will be attending there. I will be doing workshops uh, there. And then um, I believe I will be teaching a class officially at WPPI uh, with my very good friend Cheryl Walsh. And then uh, I very uh, I have a customer who is a Canson certified print lab. Uh, his name is um, Garrett Winslow, okay. uh, and uh, we will be uh, we're going to be scheduling a full day printing workshop in an auditorium, a local library. And I'll definitely be posting that on Facebook. Great. Um, so those are some definite things that will be happening um, uh, in early and later on in February. Then we have a comment from Keith Johnson, who I know is in Los Angeles. I, hey, Keith. He, he was a co-manager with, with me for the LA Photoshop users group back in the day. Cool. So yeah, he says he shopped at Freestyle for 20 plus years for all the schools that he taught at complete line of darkroom film supplies, lots of digital printer supplies. Yep. Thank you so much. I can't, you know, I've been a freestyle for 35 years and I got to tell you, I've got people that have been shopping with us longer than I've worked there. It's nice. pretty amazing. <laughs> so, and I've got, uh, I just, I mean, the, just the sheer number of influential photographers mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough to have contact with over the years and then certainly new students and educators. I'm just, you know, I'm really in a, I just, in terms of a life and a career, I couldn't be happier. You know, it's just really fortunate to be where I'm at, doing what I'm doing with the people I want to be doing it with. Excellent. So, and people can reach you at e2joseph at freestylephoto.biz, right? Yeah, e2joseph, like I say, like the alien, et. Did I say two? You said two. ETJoseph at freestylephoto.biz. Um, and I, I always tell people, look, um, I'm, I'm very busy all day long. I mean, this is, this is my unique conversation, my unique area of expertise. I try to be friendly. I try to be responsive. If I do not get back to you right away, I will get back to you. I try to be very respectful of everybody I'm working with. So for right now, right, I'm doing this. 
Um, I'm not answering the texts and the emails and the direct messages that are coming through. Right. So, um, and when I, whether I'm installing a printer or I'm working with a, I'm doing a talk at a school, you know, I try to be, you know, give everybody the same amount of respect and laser like focus and attention. So if I don't get back to you right away, I will get back to you. I assure you. Great. And, you know, at this email address, this is where you can contact Eric for information about setting up the paper profile or color profile, mm -hmm. as well as what was the name of the therapy? The inkjet paper psychotherapy sessions. Great. And every, everybody laughs when I say it, but the, the thing is, is I used to call it it's inkjet catchy, paper. Though. It's catchy, but I used to call it just inkjet paper consultation sessions. And then I started working with photographers who were also psychotherapists and we would go through the process and they're like, you know, you really kind of do what we do, but you do it for paper and digital printing. So we started ta saying that and it, it, it was catchy. It fits. Yeah. So, yeah. And then AJ asks, um, am I correct in assuming from what you've said that you do not look down on digital versus film? Um, Comment from AJ. Uh, you know what? Every, almost every time I do a talk, people ask me about this. And I got to tell you, to me, it is one big happy toolbox. I don't care if you're capturing images digitally or on film. I've seen so many beautiful images taken with pinhole cameras and Holga cameras and Diana cameras. And, you know, with very modest, you know, equipment uh, and, and to me, shoot film, scan it in, uh, shoot, you know, people are using little light boxes and using a copy stand and shooting it with their DSLR camera and a macro lens. It's all about what makes you happy. How does it make you feel inside? If you want to pr print in the dark room, we still have all of those supplies to do that with. It doesn't matter if it's dark room or digital to me, as long as you're happy and you're doing what you want to do. And, you know, as a supplier, you know, it's, we're committed to keeping those products alive. So, you know, uh, people are all the time, well, you, they say, well, you know, darkroom prints are better than digital prints. I'm like, no, you know, it's different. In painting, watercolorists and oil painters have been arguing that for centuries, which one's better. And the reality is that they're both separate media. Uh, I think they could be judged on their own to compare them really isn't fair. Um, inkjet prints are beautiful in, in, in terms of what they are and the immediacy of what we can produce. Um, darkroom prints are also beautiful, but to knock one and say one is better than the other really isn't fair. I think they're just two media that, um, that can coexist together. Uh, I remember when, I mean, I don't remember when silver took over from platinum, but platinum printers think silver printers are hacks, right? And then <laughs> color took over from black and white, right? I mean, uh, you know, black and white photography took over 90% of what we did for painting. Color um, photography took over 90% of what we did for black and white. Now, digital photography is taking a, it's just technology, right? Um, one isn't really better than the other. And, you know, for people who think film is better than digital, great. For people who think, I mean, this doesn't matter to me. You know, I just want you to be making the best work that you can, whatever you're doing. And I came from the uh, fine art world. So one of my favorite memories was when I was going to school in Boston at the School and Museum of Fine Arts. And that was connected to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It was just like a walk away. Mm -hmm. And you could set up appointments to go into their print division and I got to hold, they make you wear gloves, of course, but I got to hold original Picasso prints, Edvard Munch, I think Albrecht Durer. It mm -hmm. was pretty amazing. And, and Rembrandt, I got to hold some real Rembrandt etchings. It was fantastic. So, Well, I got to um, tell you, every school I'm going to uh, recently, especially I think the definitely the last four I've gone to where I've installed either an Epson or a Canon wide format printer, Every single lab tech wants to show me their darkroom. I mean, they are so proud of the darkroom. They're yeah. not nearly as proud of the inkjet printer that they just bought. <laughs> right. They really want to show me the darkroom. And, you know, there's, you know, I mean, it's kind of kitschy, but, you know, we say there's a magic in the darkroom, right? I mean, it's what kind of, it's certainly got what, you know, what got me hooked. 
Um, I'm not sure I really get the same excitement watching a printhead going back and forth in an inkjet printer. Some people do, you know, some people do. That's fine. Right. But, you know, watching that print come up in a tray for the first time, I don't think there's a better way to learn photography, you know, than being in the darkroom. I don't think there's a better way to learn pre-visualization, math, chemistry. I mean, there's just practical lessons that are learned with film-based photography that digital photography sometimes just kind of over, you know, overlooks, right? Um, but I'm certainly not going to necessarily take any sort of personal preference over one medium over the other. All right. So Keith says printing these days so often gets ignored and only our computers see the images we create, make those prints, buy those frames and create your own home gallery. Enjoy the art. Yeah. And Cheryl jumped in and said, yep, or yes, print your work. It'll make you a better photographer. And That's Cheryl is right. absolutely right. And so is Keith. I mean, the, the thing is, is that, um, I always see things in my prints that I never saw on the computer screen. Um, prints are a higher resolution product. Uh, they're 300 PPI. Uh, well, the prints are 300 DPI, right? We make that distinction. They're dots per inch. Your computer screen are pixels, right? Okay. Pixels are much larger than dots are. So, so, you know, your maximum pixel density on a computer screen is, you know, typically we're, we're sizing resolution is 72 ppi pixels per inch i think some of the monitors now go up to 120 i don't know i'm not i'm not up on the latest technology for them but um the reality is your prints are always going to be higher resolution product than your monitor and when you print larger you're going to see things that you didn't see when you printed smaller i mean i can't tell you how many times somebody noticed a problem with a masking layer in the final print that they didn't see on the computer screen. So it will make you a better photographer. And to Keith's point, um, one of the things that has frustrated me as being somebody who remembers um, how many camera stores we just had in the area, you know, which are all gone now. I remember so many commercial labs. Uh, I remember Photomat kiosks in every parking lot of every mall one hour labs and mini labs all over. I mean, you could throw a rock and, you know, on any street and hit a mini lab, right? They're all gone because of digital. I mean, it's really digital that has, you know, had this kind of seismic shift in our industry. And many people come to me and say, well, why print, right? I can just see it on my computer screen. Well, you know, okay, there's an NFT thing going on, but how do you sell like a digital thing on your computer screen, right? People are buying and collecting prints, right? And that's where the market is for trading in art. And I maintain that there's no way you can control what people see on a computer screen. I don't know if I show you an image that what you're seeing on your computer screen is the same thing I'm seeing. The only way I can control that is by making a print, right? I've shoot making a specific selection in paper choice, specific selection in editing. I am controlling what you see by presenting a print. And there is a lost, um, you know, that that's something that has been sacrificed or lost in digital photography for sure. And then Alan asks, would it be worth the profile? I guess the custom profile for a cheap Epson E2 2760 printer, or should I just send out for prints until I get a better printer? <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to see, that's not a number I'm familiar with because I focus on the archival pigment single use printers. I'm going to assume that that is a workforce printer. Can't really make profiles for those. They're not, right. it doesn't, you don't have the same driver. You don't have the same control. They're designed for an all in one device that, you know, you're just making prints and the driver's kind of taking over. Um, would I recommend sending your prints out until you get a printer? Maybe um, I just get the better printer, right? I mean, at a certain point we can, we can talk about that. Uh, it depends on where you really want to be. Of course, there are photographers who just don't want to print, right? They they just want to shoot. They want to do their thing. Uh, they'll send it out. They'll they'll go to the lab. They'll get proofs. They'll give them directions. They want to. That's their workflow, right? They don't want to print, and that's fine. You have to really want to print. When you get a printer, you've got to 
kind of devote yourself to it. I, I, I mean, when I have conversations with people, I say, look, the worst thing you can do for your printer is buy it and then not use it, right? Most of the problems people have, you know, with all the things you've heard of clogging and banding and then a, it's because people aren't using their printer often enough. You've really got to commit to printing something once a week. You've got to pay attention to it. You just can't let it sit. It's the worst thing you can do for any printer is just let it sit. It needs to be used. So. So, yeah, that was okay. uh, excellent. So once again, contact Eric at E.T. Joseph at freestylephoto.biz, not E2. <laughs> and, it's like the uh, alien. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. No. I think I just watched that like a few months back on Netflix again. So I'm sorry. <laughs> like, that was fun though. I like Netflix. So cool. Okay. Right, so yeah, thank you so much. It was excellent. Very well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, we've, you know, we've done a few other things in the past with clubhouse and stuff. And yep. I prefer the video platform more because at least I get to see you. I get to see something. So, and we, we, there is now Facebook does now have a uh, audio platform that we can try sometime too, but I do think it's better here because the groups I run are visual groups, Photoshop and photography focused. And so it makes more sense to mm -hmm. have a presentation where you can see, you know, elements and results, you know, yeah, for sure. So, so uh, all the thank yous are coming in. We got, uh, thank you. Awesome steps. Thank you so much. Very useful information. Yay. John says, thanks so much, Eric and Andrew. Our Thank pleasure. you, John. Yeah. You just took my last class at uh, Los Angeles Center of Photography. Excellent. I've known John for years. He's a great guy. Talented photographer, too. And Jay says, thank you so much. This was great. Thank you, Jay. So, yeah, one more time. Just to remind everyone, E.T. Joseph at freestylephotobiz.biz. I hope they I hope they don't crash the email server. <laughs> or though yeah. actually I hope they do crash the email That's server. Keep <laughs> them coming. Keep them coming. <laughs> and then as a uh, reminder, I will be posting the recordings in the various groups. So in general, always look at the top pinned post of the groups. That's where contests are, these live video events, any news, any updates, and of course, recordings of these live events like today. So thanks everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Eric. It was very informative. Excellent. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank everybody for attending, taking time out of your busy day. Have a great weekend, everybody.